Hello, I'm Brenda Murray, and this is Studio 56. And today I'm going to be interviewing the fabulous, truly fabulous watercolor artist Ron Stoke from Seattle, Washington. And Ron is a is an amazing uh, watercolor artist. His, his work is just really mouth-watering. You're going to go crazy when you see it. It's so beautiful. He's an award-winning artist, and he's a regular contributor and has been the cover artist for Watercolor Artist Magazine. I'm not surprised by that at all, uh, as well as other publications. He's, uh, he's teaching comprehensive workshops throughout North America and Europe. Ron holds signature membership with the American Watercolor Society and the National Watercolor Society and the Northwest Watercolor Society. And he's a member of the American Impressionist Society. He's been an artist ambassador for M. Graham Watercolors for over 20 years. So let's bring Ron into our call. Well, thank you for such a, a nice uh, uh, announcement. Um, thanks to all of you who have shown up today. I apologize for the torture I'm going to put you through for the next hour, but um, I want to answer any questions about how I paint, my philosophy, and um, what basically what I do um, and my approach for uh, painting and watercolor. That's fantastic. So, Ron, no need to be yeah. humble. You're so humble. Your work is so beautiful, really. <laughs> and uh, people can see that right away. And what I noticed about your work is that your watercolors have a glow. It's amazing that glow. You've able, you're you're just so good at capturing this glow with the light. Um, I, I don't know how, how you're going to have to. I hope you'll share with us how you are able to capture that glow. Absolutely. Um, I I started watercolor in high school. I, which which most of us do. You know when we think about it, watercolor is probably the one medium that we've stuck with the longest in our lives. You know, we started in elementary school, really. Yeah. Um, and my mentor was my high school instructor. He was a well-known Pacific Northwest uh, watercolorist here. And um, although I paint nothing like him, he, he taught me some really valuable lessons. One, drawing, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and two was, was values. The, the values, and, and I talk about it in my book, I talk about it in every uh, workshop I do, is without a doubt the most important part of, I, I think, visual art. Um, I didn't see it and start achieving it until later in my painting life, but it, it always stuck with me that Chuck would say, you know, make sure you get your values right. Make sure you get your values right. And and then every workshop I took uh, since then, I um, would hear the the artists talk about values. So I I really just started to explore, you know, what they were talking about. And probably 15 years ago, maybe maybe a little bit longer, um, it hit, and I just overnight it it snapped and my work changed literally overnight um brenda talked about uh me being a m graham uh, paint ambassador and those of you who know the paint you know that it's um uh, made with organ blackberry honey it it's is as part of their binder every watercolor has a sugar they just use uh, Oregon blackberry honey in theirs and it keeps every watercolor it, has a sugar yeah every watercolor has to have a sugar uh, so that it will bind to the paper that's one of the binding agents I did and not know um, that. if you guys are ever out here and you guys want to take a tour of, of M. Graham you, you'll have to give me a call so I can arrange it but it, it's fascinating um one side effect of the honey is it keeps the paint pliable and ready to paint at all times. Yeah. So when you're on location or here in the studio, the paint is is never that hard cake where we're we're spending time scrubbing and to get color. We can just go to it, grab color, 
and and apply it to the the paper. And where that helps the most is with um, my values. I can get my darks as dark as I need them. You know what? I've never heard that every watercolor has a sugar. I never heard that before. Yeah, and most I've, I've most learned large, something already. <laughs> most large companies, um, just due to the cost, they'll use, you know, cane sugar, which is, uh, you know, less expensive and a little more readily available on the mass market, and it works fine. It it works just fine, and and like Windsor Newton or Dan Smith or Holbein, some of those other companies that everybody knows, um, I still will use some of those colors because M. Graham is a limited palette. But uh, my the majority of my palette is M. Graham because of that. Wow, I, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Hmm. I, I knew that M. Graham had that honey binding. I knew about the honey, but I thought it was just a, an unusual thing. I didn't realize that every watercolor, uh, you, you know, every every uh, watercolor has to have a sugar. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wow, interesting. Okay, uh, so um, we're going to be talking today about your book, Watercolor on Plein Air. All right. On Plein Air Watercolor. And uh, this book is absolutely gorgeous. I can tell you it's 128 pages. Um, the, the, uh, the paper is shiny, glossy paper, and the color is very rich and beautiful. And uh, his work inside this water, inside this book is just outstanding. Um, I mean, oh my goodness, it's just, it's so, so beautiful. And uh, so we're going to look at some of the images that are in this book. And, uh, and so I'm going to share my screen now, Ron. And okay. so we're both going to turn off our cameras. All right. Okay. And the first image. There we go. That's the cover of your book. Um, when I, I saw this book uh, at the bookstore, and I, I had to buy it just because of the cover, the one... <laughs> The one, the one uh, painting on the cover was so outstanding and so eye grabbing and just, you know, just rich in color and so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I really don't like washy watercolors. And um, I really like to see a strong light dark contrast because I think it's just a lot more eye catching. And, yeah. Uh, and you really do that. You really capture that in your in your all of your paintings. So Ron, in this book, um, you talk about how drawing is the foundation of your paintings. And uh, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your, your drawing philosophy. Absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's interesting because I, I you know, I, I teach workshops um, throughout the year and it is probably the number one thing that I get, I get asked about or or I get, um, you know, students saying that they can't draw, they have they have a hard time with perspective, you know, so on with figures and so on and so forth. And I, I include those lessons in my my workshops. We have a figure day, we have a perspective day. Um, but I think what what people are are thinking they need to do is is draw you know super correct and they need to draw their figures really uh anatomically correct they need to draw their cars to look like cars and my my main suggestion is is just throw that out out the window because especially for the watercolor medium you, there's there's drawing for drawing sake where you you want to you know draw a complete finished drawing and then there's drawing for a painting sake and watercolors probably the number one medium where almost an edited scribble will will be to your advantage more so than a complete drawing and there's there's a page and I'll, I'll try to find it and I can show it um, where I show, you know, a drawing of a, a figure, how I would draw it, and then I show a, uh, the same figure 
how I would draw it for a painting. And I think, I think that's probably the biggest hurdle artists get over in some of my classes is, oh, it doesn't need to look exactly like that because I'm going to apply paint and I want the, I want to release tension throughout the painting. I want it to connect. And so, so maybe I don't need to, you know, draw that arm, you know, if we're looking at this painting here, the, uh, the main figure, you'll see if we're looking at it, his right side, it's actually his left arm, you know, just blends into the background and those other figures. And that's, that's where we release that tension and connect that figure to the painting. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about releasing tension. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's so important with watercolor. And we've all heard it. We've all, maybe we've all said it where it's that, that uh, outlined image or object where there's a, a white line that, um, that separates our objects. That is, is just an, an Achilles heel for, for beginning watercolors. And believe me, I, I did it probably worse than anyone. And until it clicked, the, those edges of your objects they need to blend in. They need to connect to these these other objects in or around them. Um, you know, this painting here is uh, of one of the marinas here in Seattle. And if you if you take your your finger and you start on the left hand side with the the boat uh, with the red stripe, and and you just squint, there's there's a thread almost through the entire painting where it connects the left to the right. And if you, if you squint and, and get rid of all of the color, just where you're seeing value, I've also connected the top to the bottom with the sailboat mass and the reflections. That's what I'm talking about, about connecting and releasing tension. Well, we'll I, I'll, I'll point it out more as we go through and look at some of these images. Yeah, well, you cover that in your book. Uh, there's a whole chapter called Composition and Tension. And, um, and you talk about the negative tension of a solid shape and you talk about breaking tension um, yeah. and so on. And so, so, so on this painting- Oh, sorry. Go back just a sec. So on this painting, the, the two main boats here, the one with the red stripe and the one with the uh, blue stripe, in between them is a, um, a uh, box that uh, uh, you know, stores stuff. And you, you see that when I painted the sky, and you can probably imagine me just going through the sky, I start with uh, probably a cerulean blue, I go to a yellow ochre, and I go all the way through these boats. I might change color or value, but I continue the wash. And you can see that box there, the big box, where I went just right through it. And if you look just to the, the right of it, where the, um, the boat with the red stripe is, you can see the same color that's there. It's the same wash. And then what I did later on after that wash was dry, I applied my darks. And you see how it just kind of, it's, it's back painting essentially. But you can do that with your, your darks, you can do that with your lights, and you almost have to, to make the painting kind of connect. Hmm. Very interesting. You're, you're talking about things that I've actually, I don't really know a lot about, and so I'm learning a lot. I'm just, <laughs> normally I have a lot more questions than comments, but, uh, but I'm just trying to absorb all this and take it in. Um, this is the kind of painting here, this example that I was talking about when I talked about how you are so, uh, so gifted really at capturing a glow. And uh, it's, it's, it's stunning. It's just so gorgeous, Ron. I mean, really. Um, Thank you. Thank you. This is one of my, it's a, one of my favorite paintings. It's of uh, a church in Prague. And I was just tooling around, you know, at night, just, um, you know, getting 
getting ideas and and this church was lit up at the top and and that's really just knowing when to stop and yeah. and leave that clean color you know if you if you look at the the you know top portion of of the painting i i applied the the yellow and then i i stayed out of it you know a couple little detail hits and and misses there but then then i was out of there i, I left it alone yeah uh, so, I mean, I, I think that part of this, the, um, the way you've captured this glow has to do with that really strong, light, dark contrast, uh, the darker, the that, darks. The, that's, ex the yeah, that's exactly right. And there's your values playing into it. If I didn't have that, that shape to the right of it, that dark, um, structure it, at the top, that architectural detail, the the glow wouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah, it's really outstanding. It's just beautiful. I really love it. Okay, and so one of the things you said in, in this chapter in your book about composition intention was keep the corners boring. <laughs> yeah, that's just a silly saying I, I I always use, and it's it basically it's it's just reminding everyone what they already know and that's you know not to not to put your subject matter in the corner and to lead the viewer into the painting by by not putting certain details you know in the corner that will catch their eye so in this painting is of safeco field our baseball uh, field here um you, you'll notice that not only did and this is the structure so i didn't i didn't add anything here the rounded structure at the top right hand corner it just it leads the viewer's eye right to the subject matter right and then the red and also the values my darkest darks are right in this bottom left area the most exciting uh colors are there my smaller shapes are even there. And we talk about that a lot, where if, if you look at this painting and you squint down, it's really only two or three shapes. You know, it's the field, the, the stadium that blends right into the tree, that blends right into the background of the, the building, and then just peppered little shapes throughout it to add interest. Mm -hmm. So in this, Using this uh, painting as an example about tension, um, what you said about the boats has to do with not outlining uh, and, and allowing the shapes to kind of blend into each other. And I was thinking that about the figures in this sketch, in this painting. How yeah. They... Can you talk about that? Yeah, again, if you if you start on the left hand side where the guy with the, the you know, cap or the uh, pub cap is is walking toward us. You know, if you if you start your finger right there behind the, the gal or the other figure in the back and you just draw it across the painting, there's there's nothing really stopping you. There's there's the cafe sign, but that doesn't that doesn't stop you. It's not a strong vertical line. Um, the way the uh, this big shape on your right, how, yeah, there's some exciting things going on, but they're all soft. And they're all about the same value and how it just it walks right into the tree. We still understand that that's a tree because of what's above the horizon line, really. But yet everything else mixes in. It captures some, some cars. It even, you know, if you drag your finger there, you can even see where I just ran right into the car and then right into some of those background figures all the way up to my main guy. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's it's really beautiful. I, a lot of uh, artists talk to me about how do they put figures in their drawings. And um, so, I mean, it's, uh, I think what, what you're showing here in your painting is that the figure doesn't have to be so um, delineated. It can just be implied. They, they're they're just blobs, and just and blob, yeah. really they they really are. And we um we talk about that 
in in some of the workshops and i use i use some of the students as examples where how they how they look at figures rather than how they see a figure is so interesting to me and until i until i got it i did the same thing i i would see that object as an object that's solely on its own. And then I would go to the next object, even if there were figures. Yet you have to think about how they're connected to the background and how we do that is with value. Right. Wow. And so uh, Karen says, wow, what beautiful paintings and such light contrast. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. And also, um, we have a question here. Sorry, Ron. Uh, Peter yeah. is asking, is gum Arabic a sugar? No, gum arabic is the um, is the main part of the the binding. That's what uh, it does it does two things. It helps fix the the paint to the paper, but it also helps us reconstitute a watercolor. Um, yeah, and there's everybody hears gum arabic, but there, you know there's several other things that you know companies use like ox gall or um or the other uh oh shoot i can't think of it but it's just one of the ingredients that you know helps the paint do what it it does yeah in this painting here it's reminding me of something you said in your book um you were talking about uh let me see if i can find it you said um you were talking about uh, tension and talking about painting solid forms and you used the idea of the, uh, as an example, you used windows. And here is just great. I mean, this is this, I don't see this image in your book, but this is a, another great example of, um, of not uh, painting the, every detail of the window. And, uh, and you talked about that in your book about tension. Yeah, and about shapes. We um, one of the one of the pages in the book is uh, talking about shapes and and the and the four shapes that we have seen for so in our life. But probably we could recognize those shapes before we could talk. Right. And they were circle, triangle, square, and the number one, which is a rectangle. And, you know, here we, here we are, you know, looking at an architectural piece that's got all of these rectangles. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was to spell out every single window, you know, with, you know, a labored, you know, value solid shape, it would, it would draw your eye. It would have too much tension and it would draw your eye to that hotel where you where the viewer where I intend the viewer to go is the two figures crossing the crosswalk right. so again you know look at the look at the building on the left hand side it just kind of blurs in and out of the cars all the way over to where I've left the you know white of the paper underneath the monument and the uh, crosswalk so there's all my little shapes there's all my darkest darks and there's my my biggest contrast of value okay i think i'm starting to understand a little bit more about what what you're talking about with uh when you say tension because in your book you're talking about the negative tension of a solid shape and you use um these uh windows in buildings as an example and it is really really true that if you know, if, if somebody took the time to paint in detail uh, every single window, um, it's, it's, first of all, the person's, the viewer's eye is going to go to that block of rectangles right. rather than the people. And, and it'll be, it'll be so difficult to get off of that, to get to my, you know, my figures in this case. And look, you guys, I, I was a designer. I, my first job out of college was an architectural renderer. So I, yeah, I, I can draw perspective and I can draw all these fun columns and stuff, but it was also the number one thing I had to break where 
it just took me so long to see it. Well, I mean, I think the thing with with our paintings and our drawings is that um, we're not drawing for the sake of so, someone's not taking that drawing then making a building out of it. So it doesn't have to be, you know, accurate. It doesn't we don't have to measure it with a ruler and make sure right. that all the yeah. windows are exactly lined up and the same width and distance apart and all those things. Absolutely. And yeah. And if, I, you, if you guys ever saw this building, you would you would know that I knocked off a floor. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> because, yeah, it just didn't work in the painting. So instead of five floors, I gave it four and and that was fine. Cool. Yeah, I, it's I do that all the time myself uh, is I, I take out whole floors or I make a, a really long wit, uh, building that's boring and I and I shorten it, I cram it together and take out a whole section in the middle and so on. And uh, absolutely. Because, you're making yeah. art, so it's, uh, it's you're more making interesting. art. That's that's absolutely right, Brenda. And you know, we're we're not photographers. And I'll oh. tell you, the the worst photographers are usually artists, because we're taking we're taking our photos for the reference. We're we're saying, hey, you know, that's an interesting composition with the rainy street and the monument. I'm gonna snap this picture. So we grab our phone and we and we take this picture. We're not thinking of composition. We're not thinking of anything other than just, hey, I want to get this, this information so then I can go back and work on a painting of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One other question I have about this um, uh, painting is the use of red. So I read somewhere, um, some other artist, I can't even remember who it was now, uh, talked about how he tries to put red in every painting. A, just a dot somewhere and yeah. uh, as sort of a way of capturing people's attention is that uh, something that you you agree with well i i know the artist you're talking about it's probably alvero and um, no i don't think it is that doesn't no, sound familiar. No. yeah I, I'm not, I can't i honestly cannot remember but i if that were the name i would have remembered well uh, yes i do agree with that and and you can you can use, you know, your opaque colors or some of your more interesting colors to, to draw attention. Now, it won't draw as much attention as value, but it does add to, you know, the, the overall painting. Now, let me point out the, the master at this is uh, a San Francisco artist by the name of Wayne Tebow. Okay. He he was the artist who did the cupcakes and the and the uh, cakes in the in the deli in inside the display, and he did a lot of interesting landscapes where he would use almost a a, a pointillism application where he would instead of just red he would go red yellow blue. So he would use the primaries to kind of enhance edges and things. And when you think about it, it's, it's genius because the, you know, as using all three complements, or I mean, using all three primaries, mm -hmm. it just harmonizes the painting. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to look at his art. What, yeah. Can you repeat his name? What was his name? It's Wayne Tebow. Okay. Uh, I hadn't heard that, and I don't. I'm not familiar with Wayne Tebow, but I'm definitely going to look that up from San Francisco. Yeah, as soon as you see his stuff, you'll you'll recognize it. He's he's a very well known artist. Okay. Now, unlike unlike Wayne, I'm I'm more of a value painter, as you can probably tell. Yeah, and so I really limit my palette. Look look at this painting. This this is a perfect example. I probably have used four colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so H Helen comments, she says she loves how the essence of the view is implied without details. She says, I get lost in capturing the details. I, I, I imagine she means when she's painting. Helen, I hear you as, as a, <laughs> as a uh, uh, architectural detail or architectural render, I used to draw everything. And I would, 
I would have this successful painting and then I would step off of it and I would think, why does that not look good? And, you know, until you really see it or until, you know, you're, you're forced to see it, it's really hard. Here, here's a perfect example of the keep your corners boring. So the boat on the left, I could have painted that, that boat and tire um, with more detail. Right. But, but look at how I just flooded, you know, I painted the, the cool color. I, I threw in probably this is cad red, cad red medium. And I, and I let the water just take both colors and create this more interesting color. And look how your eye passes right over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I say boring, I, I, I guess I mean more, more than anything, I guess I mean relieve tension. Yeah, well, I mean, I think also you're, you are focusing your viewer's eye and, and pro pro almost no artist puts the most interesting thing in the corner. <laughs> right. In the bottom, right. you know, left corner, they're going to put it somewhere in the that rule of thirds, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Middle part. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good. Uh, so I've got a question here for or a comment from Helen. She says, yes, exclamation point. I was an architect <laughs> in my past life. So <laughs> Helen, Ron, I think I'm going to have to hold a webinar on for recovering architects. Yes. Yes. A, uh, support group or something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was I once a detail drawer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really love drawing details myself as well. And um, yeah, but sometimes uh, it, there's a difference between painting, a, a really successful painting, I think, and a drawing, you know, that is more on the details. It is more yeah. about the details. And, and we've all picked a medium that you can achieve some really detailed stuff. I mean, it, with it with me with watercolor i i think it's the most versatile medium because you can you can get something like this where it's just a, a suggestion and an impression or you can go all the way and get almost a photorealistic image mm -hmm. i i personally think the interest of watercolor is more of this an edited brush stroke mm -hmm. strong value strong color and and let the viewer decide, let, you know, engage the viewer in deciding, you know, what the painting's about. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you on all those points. I think that that strong light dark contrast, the stronger use of more saturated color is far more interesting for people than these kind of washy uh, watercolors that you sometimes see. So Peter is asking a question. He says, at what time of day do you feel the light is best for landscapes? Uh, in the rain for street scenes, is there preferred time of day? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, let me, let me say this first. I probably first thing in the morning, you know, first light, or high noon, I, I like three, the three, you know, most extreme. So first thing in the morning when, when the light's, you know, rising, high noon, where you get these strong, strong values. And then just before the, the magic hour of um, sunset, it just, it, it exaggerates the, the values, all of those, the values, the colors, um, the saturation, all of those things. I mean, this is a perfect example. This was, you know, right in the morning. This is Prague. And this, the light was just streaming down the street. I don't even know how it, it, it just was a perfect opportunity. And, and then I exaggerated, you know, how dark the tree was, the reflections, um, because I wanted to really tell the viewer, hey, this is was a strong light. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And again, that's that glow that you are so, I mean, it must be your signature uh, because, you know, that glow with a strong light, dark contrast and that glow is made all the glowier by the really dark architecture bits on the left. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. stunning. 
uh, and the diagonal that's you know bringing your eye right in to the you just want to go down the street and see what's going on down there <laughs> yeah yeah it's really beautiful um carla's carla's going back to her question about the m graham paints and she she wants to know what is it about their paint that you like over other paints well the the honey aspect is is really it, it's huge for me because i um i do paint outdoors um and you know whether i'm in arizona or up here i always that paint's always ready to paint it's it's I never have to struggle to get color. And a lot of a lot of artists just they say, well, why don't you just spray it, you know, with your spray gun? And and that's fine, but you spray it if you're in Arizona and you spray it five minutes later, it's it's back to where it was. And so I'm a, a believer in, you know, spend less time on your palette, more time on your on your painting. Um it's uh it's just really, really buttery and, and nice. All right. So I'm going to, uh, Carla says, that would be great. <laughs> and uh, she's asking, Ron, is there any possibility of a Zoom workshop in the works? That would be great for those of us who don't travel as much. Well, Ron, you and I did chat about this, did we not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we and we a haven't, lot of them. <laughs> and we don't ahead, have sorry. a solid plan, do we? Yeah, we, we've kind of we're still working out our, 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 uh, our deal, but as far as the zoom workshops, um, you know, I, you were, I was forced to do them in, uh, during the pandemic. I don't have any currently, uh, scheduled, but you know, I'm, I'm up for everything. Yeah. Anything. So yeah. I'll, I'll talk to Brenda. Yeah. We had talked about doing a zoom workshop together, uh, in March. And, uh, and that's as far as it got. So uh, if we're going to do that wrong, we got some work to do. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should push it back, you know, just yeah. so, you know, because that yeah. gets the end of July, uh, January now. Yeah. But so we'll, figure, we'll figure something out. Yeah. If you're interested in that, um, then I would suggest you uh, follow uh, and subscribe. Probably that's the best thing. Subscribe to the Studio 56 uh, newsletter because all new workshops are announced there and if you go to www.studio56boutique.com you'll see a pop-up after like five seconds where you can subscribe to the newsletter so if you're not already subscribed uh, just fill that in and subscribe there you won't be bothered with a lot of things because I I, I struggle to even get it out once a month so. Um, but if you go there, there should be all the announcements for upcoming workshops are there. So Ron, oh my goodness, I love this painting so much. You've got your dabs of red. You've <laughs> got this, this uh, huge sign in the middle. And it's amazing how great this sign looks. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just a, a study in, in value. I mean, if you, if you really squint down. The whole background just connects and and does what it's supposed to do. And then the figures to the right do what they're supposed to do in that, you know, they they come forward. Now, the the gal in the yellow coat wouldn't do what she's doing unless I had the guy in front of her in that dark. So if you, if you put your finger there. Yeah. You can kind of tell. So you needed him to be yeah. there to make her pop out. Yeah. Right. Cool. So those of you who, who've been to Seattle, so this is where they throw the fish. That's right in front of us. And then if you walk down to the right, just a couple blocks, that's the first Starbucks. Wow. <laughs> and I notice, um, like Hazel Sohn, who's also uh, works with me, no feet. The feet are implied in your feet. I give permission to all my students never to paint a foot again. Okay. <laughs> all right. I love this one. This is just really so beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's super cool. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It's really lovely. Tell me about this painting. Well, where, where you, you really see you know, the difference between the last painting and this painting, just this strong value in the, in the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then really everything in the background is just a just you know a, a gray where i've you know i haven't hesitated i've just laid it in because we want we, we want an abstract area or an area that, that gives the viewer a little break. And I think the background, the majority of this painting does that. And then we have these really interesting lights and darks with the Turk, with the cobalt teal and, you know, very little detail. I always get you know, when I have a show, I get people coming up and saying, oh, your, your paintings are so detailed. And, and I think you should have seen my paintings 25 years ago. You yeah, know, they were yeah. really detailed. These, these are just blobs. They're just shapes and value. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things you mentioned in your book. You talk about thinking in terms of value instead of color. And, you know, when I'm looking at this painting, I'm thinking, okay, if I were there in person, what we would be seeing is we would be seeing a lot of, there, there would be a lot of color in the background. First of all, the sky, um, and then, you know, all these, the water and all these bridges and the, you know, the, the hills in the background and so on. Yeah. And, but you've just done them as a gray tone. Um, yeah. Because I knew that they would compete. There, there's a real large group of trees, like in the almost in the middle of the painting. If I would have painted that, you know, green that I did see, then it, it would have just complicated the painting. The shape is enough. The shape of the the spires on the right, the bridges that are going across. There's so much interest there yeah. that if I applied it, then your eye wouldn't go, you know, where I intended it. And the same thing goes for this church in front here. I think this is a church. Um, even though I painted the shadows really, really nice and dark and juicy, you know, everybody knows if we're sitting there and we're looking long enough, we see every detail in that wall. Mm -hmm. And so I, you, you have to force yourself to just ignore it. Yeah. I, I think that the, 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 the thing that um, probably most artists, uh, learning artists um, struggle with is understanding what to edit out or not necessarily leave it out, but just not focus on it. Like to really, really look at a scene and say to yourself, okay, we are not paying attention to any of this. We're only going to, I'm going in my painting. My goal is to only make people's eyes, only make people focus on this one part right here. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's the, most, the challenge. The most underused color in our palette is gray. Mm -hmm. And it should be, I mean, my, you know, in my opinion, you know, who am I? But in my opinion, it should be one of our, our most common. Because regardless whether you're in Seattle, <laughs> where it's gray, or, <laughs> or California, the, yeah. everything is connected by grays. They could be cool, they could be warm, but it's what connects all of these interesting things. And I, I like to, you know, paint my own or, you know, make my own grays. And I like to mix them on the paper too because they, they'll make even a more interesting gray than what's what I mix in my palette yeah um I was surprised you didn't bring up my my other silly quote and that's to deal exactly with this if you can't hit it with a baseball don't paint it and what I mean by that is you know the group of trees back there of course we can't hit it with a baseball so we treat it just as a shape and and in this case just the the edges you know I, I don't care about what's going on inside that shape it's just the edges of that shape yeah yeah I should have brought up that quote that's a, that is a really <laughs> good quote and you're absolutely right and I think th thinking in terms of shapes is uh is really uh fundamental uh, before you sit down to draw even drawing even if you're drawing details you're still drawing shapes 
Um, I think it's really important to think in terms of shapes rather than, you know, what even the thing is. Like, forget about it that this is a person or a figure. Just think about it in terms of shapes. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. This is out. This is so stunning. So beautiful. It's such a nice, um, it's such a pleasant um, palette that you've used here in this one. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's got a nice mood to it. It's a quiet painting. Yeah. Um, no red, yeah, as no. you can see. <laughs> but what I, I used is a lavender or a uh, king's blue. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it was more about the reflections and, and tying in the reflections. Yeah, it's really beautiful, Ron. I, I really like this one a lot. Thank you. Um, so Helen is asking, do you have a favorite paper? And by the way, people, if you want to ask questions, you can just type them in the Q&A box. I, I do. Um, and I use uh, uh, Saunders 140 pound, uh, cold press and rough. I, I like it. I, I've used Arch and I've, I, I still paint with Arch every, every once in a while. Um, but why I like Saunders is it gives me a little bit more time. If, if that makes sense. It, and it could be like 10 seconds, but we all know 10 seconds in a watercolor is almost a lifetime. Yeah. So that's, <clears throat> that's, that's the paper I, I like. And uh, we'll, we'll show my sketchbooks here in a second. I use this, uh, my sketchbook is really one of the only things that I, I like to promote because it is just the best watercolor sketchbook I've found. And I work really well with this company. So what I do is, is for my workshops, I'll get them to provide a sketch pad for all the students nice. who sign up for the workshop. Oh, what is the sketch pad? It's, um, it's called an Aqua B Super Deluxe. Wow. I, I don't think I've heard of that. Who, who makes it? Uh, Aqua B. Aqua B. They're, they're a 70 year old company. They started out East. They used to do government contracts. They, it's craziest stories out of these guys. And they made this paper. I don't know what for, but it works fantastic for watercolor. Wow. Sorry, I meant to ask, um, Jenna had a question from the previous sketch. Uh, she wants to know, is that lavender opaque or mixed with wash? No, it's opaque. And, and that's right out of the tube. I, I stick my brush right into the tube and just blot it right on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had not heard of that sketchbook either. So that's an American brand? Yeah, yeah. A good old American brand. It's and Who um, sells it? Where, like, where can you buy it? Oh, you can buy it at like Cheap Joe's. They care. I mean, if you check your local guys first, but uh, Cheap Joe's or... Uh, Jerry's or any of the web guys uh, uh, should carry it. Yeah, there's so few. Um, I find here anyway. There's so few art supply stores. Um, there's there's really there's there are none in my town. Just a Michaels. And I so, know. It's yeah, just it's, there used to be so many, and it's it's a shame. I love going into art stores. I whenever I travel, I try to find an art store. Oh yeah, me and, too. Absolutely. I have I'm just brown. <laughs> uh, Carla says Blick has it. The Dick Blick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So here we have another painting with this gorgeous glow that you're so good at. It's really, really outstanding. Thank you. One of, one of my favorites. I, I love to paint interiors. Um, you know, this is a good example of uh, keeping your corners boring. You, you'll see, I mean, I, I fully intended your eye to go toward the, the lamp and the statues. But if you go to the top left, you see how I just kind of diluted the frames a little bit with a wash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful painting. Wow. Spectacular. Really, really spectacular. My goodness. Wow. It's lovely, Ron. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, people are, are uh, 
if, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Deborah is asking, would it be possible to put these references in the newsletter? References to uh, where to buy things. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I really can't put stuff like that in the newsletter. Um, there, there isn't space for it. Um, but uh, if, if you have a pen and paper, I suggest you write it down um, from this interview right now. And uh, the recording of this interview will be on the YouTube channel. So you can go back later and uh, write down certain things. This yeah, one is I'll so beautiful. I'll show you the, the cover and, and give you the spelling for the, for the um, pad. Okay. Uh, so one of the things you, you said in your book is that by working on plein air, your brush, brush strokes become reactionary rather than calculated. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just, you, you don't have the time. Most of the time, <laughs> I probably look like an insane person, but most of the time I'm, I'm squinting. You know, I, I, I rarely, nor do I care about the color. I just want the values. Um, you know, here's, here's a, a painting I, I did in England that um, you, you know that that brick house had all of those brick details on it. Yeah. But it's not important to the painting. You know, it's just the, I, I left the white of that little, you know, sunroom or whatever it was, you know, white and clean. Look at the dark uh, brush and, you know, quick brush strokes for the fence. And then there's the lavender again, where I just kind of blotted in these, um, are they Camillas or? irises maybe i i don't know but they're just gorgeous look yeah. at look at the palette you know one two three maybe four colors again mm -hmm. i know it's i know it's in the name <laughs> watercolor but i think one of the things that benefit that benefited me is moving to a more limited palette yeah and and you know this is a good this is a good variety of paintings where you can see all the different moods and even though I used, you know, four colors in most, most of the paintings, they still, they still look complete. They still look finished. And I, I venture to say they're more interesting than if I was to add two or three more colors to this painting. I think it would complicate it and, and make it look busy. Yeah. And that's what I, I didn't want. Yeah. Yeah, I think in the natural world around us, when we see something that's really beautiful, um, we're likely focusing on just part of it. Um, there's likely things in in a scene, you know, if you're in the woods, you're looking, you know, off on a street scene or whatever. Um, there's likely things there that uh, if you had the choice, you probably wouldn't put put that right. thing right there because right. it's it's distracting or it's not it's not complementary to the rest the part that you think is beautiful yeah. and uh, when we're making a painting like this we're editing out and only putting in the parts that are beautiful and that uh, has to do with the colors as well if you put every single color that's in your watercolor palette um you're gonna have a patchwork quilt it's gonna look very yeah and it would just like that's where you know tension comes into play with color yeah and temperature things like that so that that tension applies through through the entire painting it's not just you know the lines and where to place things it's a color harmony values things like that mm -hmm. yeah um georgia says when do you know when a painting is finished georgia i don't <laughs> <laughs> um well my 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 mentor chuck he would say whenever you start breathing from your shoulders um another another artist who I just adored and I was able to take his workshop is whenever you start looking to put a brush stroke if okay. if if that if you're in that spot then stop yeah. sign it I have a technical question to ask you and I I was thinking about this earlier on that one painting I'll I'll, I'll go back 
the painting, uh, the, the street scene, these really super straight lines, super straight, super fine lines. And also uh, in this one that we were just looking at with the sailboats, these super straight, super fine lines. How is that accomplished? Oh, Brenda, I love you. They, if, if you guys saw these paintings, you would think, oh my gosh, Ron has really got a shake. They are not straight. The, what happens is I, I use a rigger brush. And what, what I try to do is get that, that nice dry brush where it's broken. I, I do it quickly. Yeah. So maybe it's, it's straight-ish. But I'll tell you, they're not straight. But oh, thank it you. looks so straight to me. It's <laughs> such a fine line. You are amazing. That is amazing. Wow. This is this is my uh, front room, and I, as you if you guys saw when you saw the studio here, I have a disease about collecting these darn boats. I just love them, and so I I always paint them. <laughs> It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Are you a, a boater yourself? No, not anymore. No. Too expensive. Yeah. I think this is our last sketch. Is it not, Ron? Is it? Yeah. I, okay. I think so. Yeah. I don't have any more to go. So you can turn your uh, camera back on. All right. And uh, so, Ron, you are going to share your screen and we're, show us your sketchbooks. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to talk to you guys about... Um, what I was what I was referring to in the drawing. So I hope I hope everybody can see this. So in the middle here, here is is a drawing where I would you know draw for drawing sake. But here is the drawing I did for for this painting right here. So you can see where uh you know you can see the painting that i've done there um the drawing on the far side is the drawing i did for that and i wanted to show you the difference of how i draw for a painting rather than how i would draw for a drawing okay so so this one here is the one for the painting yeah Okay, and the one in the middle is the one that you draw just for the sake of drawing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Wow, there's a, that's interesting, interesting to see. Okay, so this book, Ron, is available where? Where can people buy your book? Well, I, I always say check your local book guys, but um, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, I've seen it at um, both. Um, and it's um, not the next great American novel, but we yes, had fun it is. doing it. It is. And, it's a lovely, lovely book. It's beautiful. And, uh, it really is. Yeah, it was. It was fun, and we. I, I enjoyed doing it. And just kind of a fun uh, piece of trivia: when I first started in in high school, my uh, aunt bought me my very first watercolor book, and I imagine. Every, everybody has this book. It's a, it was a Walter Foster. It was one of those big, uh, you know, big books they they came out with back in the day, and it was the watercolor book. I memorized this book. I mean, I went over every page and just soaked it in. And so years later, when Walter Foster approached me to do a book for them, I, I was just it was a no brainer. I was just really excited. Do you know what? The thing that's the most exciting for me about that story, thank you, Ron, is what an amazing aunt. What oh, a lovely aunt. Absolutely. Oh my she, gosh. She was so, she was great. I could tell you stories all day. But um, so this is, this is that, that book. Let me get this off of here for a second. So it, this is what it looks like. And, and that's the logo. Sorry. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> so it's, it's, called, it's called the B Paper Company Super Deluxe Mixed Media 
book and and if you can that's the logo you see it right there i have never heard of them it it's just a great great book and i'll show you so what we would do on location i'll give you a sneak peek of an article i'm writing for uh for uh, watercolor Ma or artist magazine, so we we may do this on location. So that's my my sketch, and that's you know that's a half hour sketch. Again, look how limited the palette is, it's just of these uh, of this marina that's close to the house. Then I would take a picture, and then back in the studio, you know I have all of that information to create the the actual painting beautiful and, and just so, a few a few dabs of red there <laughs> a few dabs yeah. and so what i recommend is you know take the picture we always do we always will um for reference but then do this do the sketch whether it be a value study or in this case a value color study and and then bring that back to your studio. And, and I would say refer to that more than your, um, your photograph, because in the photograph, there's all these little details that aren't gonna help you. But in that sketch, you're, you know, you limit yourself to an hour and try not to get all of the details. Yeah. And so when you're painting it back in your studio, it'll, it'll help you, help you edit that more yeah. so you're editing out in the sketch and you're probably editing out even further in the actual painting absolutely yeah, yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of a discipline isn't it yeah it really is and and you know it takes practice yeah. um we do things like this this is kind of a fun idea where you know, if we're in one location, you know, we were we were in Pisa. You know, we'll do a couple different different um, uh, not Just not applications, thumbnail. but you know, here's here's my color. You know, maybe a, a one that I would take back to the studio. But you know, the the tower and the the baptistry, you know, I just did them really quickly, really rough. And then I had this pin that I was trying out. It was a water soluble pin that, you know, I just played with little, you know, ideas and, and that's a fun page. You know, there's a lot oh, yeah. of artwork there and a lot of, yeah. a lot of really good memories too. Yeah. Um, nobody ever wants to look at our photographs. They always want to look at our sketchbooks. Yeah, of course. That's far, far more interesting. I think you're, I'm excited now because I'm going to uh, Pisa uh, with Hazel Sohn in September. So oh, nice. a couple of more questions, comments. Um, so Peter says, amazing art. Thank you, Ron. I just ordered your book. Best Peter. So nice. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, you know Peter. what? I think people, we should all, I'm so touched by his story of his aunt that I feel like I should go and buy some kind of any kind of art uh, materials or equipment and send it to a niece or nephew right away. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And uh, Paul says, hi, Paul. Hey, bonjour. I haven't seen Paul since uh, Avignon. So the 93 pound paper works okay with wet media, he's asking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just how it's sized. They, they size the paper, you know, internally and externally. So it, it works out really well. And I use this, um, this is a 14 by 17, but they, they have really fun sizes. They have, you know, panoramic, they have squares, you know, of course, now made 12. Um, and it's just one that I've always used and, and it just works well. It takes the, the color and the washes well. Um, yeah. You've just answered Monica's question. She asked, what size is your sketchbook? Yeah. And uh, Carla says, Ron's book is one of the best that I have. It, this is a gorgeous book. I want to encourage everyone. Um, Checks in the mail, Carla. Yeah. <laughs> and Jenna is, uh, she says, um, obviously you're so skilled. I wonder if you could entertain us with a story about someone insulting your work or your career choice. Oh, well, gosh, that happens every day. No, um, 
I, I always get I, one, one in particular that I always bring up at, at workshops. And it's not, it's not that it's that entertaining, but it's, it's just one that was, was Life. very interesting. Yeah. A woman, uh, I did a painting and you know how you, you leave certain areas, you know, that might be white and, and yeah. you, as an artist, you're unconscious about them. You're, you're just skipping over them with your brush. Um, this, and so this, this, I showed this painting and, and one, one woman said, well, why did you put the goose there? And I said, goose. And it was probably a marina scene. And I said, goose, what are you talking about? And, and she came up to me and she pointed right at the one white spot that I just, you know, briefly edited over not thinking about it and it was the shape of a goose <laughs> and I, I couldn't look at that painting the same way she saw something that was she yeah saw... you you know how we're look we look at tile floors and we see things yeah that's what that's what happened that's hey one thing. one last thing um and we'll we'll have all of the details worked out soon but um the trip to Italy uh, we're going to go to a little town called Arezzo, and the reason reason why is one, it's beautiful, and two, um, the brush that I use is um, they they manufacture it there, and they're really great people, and they they love to support me, so I love to support them, and so if I take a group there, we're going to tour the brush facility, and then every every student's going to get a brush. Um, I don't know if you guys paint with these quills, but um, it's the brush manufacturer is called Tintoretto. Yeah. And it's, Good it's name. there. What is it? Good name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's easy to remember. And um, it's just a fun way to learn about how, you know, some of our materials are made and uh, take a, a little break. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that uh, workshop that Ron is talking about will be an in-person workshop next May 2024. So lots of time to think about it, but, uh, you know, first come, first serve on the tickets. They're not available yet, uh, uh, so please uh, subscribe to our newsletter, Studio 56 Boutique uh, newsletter. If you go to our website, there'll be a pop-up. If you're unsubscribed, you can click there and fill it in, and you'll get all the information will be announced there sometime soon. And uh, also, Ron and I are talking about a live in-person no, not in person, a live online workshop uh, this March, um, teaching um, watercolor. And so uh, if people are interested in that, that's also not on the website yet. But if you subscribe to the newsletter, it will be uh, posted in there sometime soon. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. Thanks for every everybody sticking around and, and listening to the stories. Yeah. Um, I hope to see you soon in, in a workshop or uh, maybe just out painting. Yeah. So now we talked about having a draw for this book, for a copy of this book. Okay, we're ready to do our draw. So exciting. All the names are in here. So unfortunately, Ron is not in the same building as me. So he can't be the one to pull the names out of the container. It's going to have to be me, but he will read them. Okay, Ron, are you ready? Drum roll, are you ready? Drum roll, please. Drum roll, please. Okay, I'm not looking. I'm just picking one piece of paper. And the person is? The winner is? Oh, say something. I can't. You're, I switched screens. Can you see it? Belinda Fry. Belinda Fry. Congratulations, Belinda Fry. So exciting. Exciting. So, uh, Ron, you're going to, uh, I'm going to send you Belinda's uh, mailing address and you're going to mail her a book. Is that right? I, I will personalize it for Belinda and, and mail it out. Good. Great. Thanks so much, Ron. Thank you. So generous of you to provide that book and uh, congratulations, Belinda. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. Ron, did you have some final comments you'd like to make? Just thank you, Brenda, and thanks everybody again. Have a great weekend, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Ron. So I have a couple of announcements uh, to uh, let people know that we have a free interview coming up with Hazel Sohn, who is an amazing, gorgeous, fabulous 
watercolor artist like Ron, very similar actually, and her skill level is outstanding. And uh, we're going to be having an interview with Hazel on her book, The Art of the Limited Palette. And, uh, and we're going to be doing a draw for this book. We'll be doing a draw for this book during that interview. And that interview is going to be held on February the 3rd. So uh, to sign up for a free ticket, you go to www.studio56boutique.com and uh, look at the pull down menu there uh, and sign up for that interview, The Art of the Limited Palette with Hazel Sohn. Also, she's going to be teaching a live uh, workshop on February 25th based on her book, The Art of the Limited Palette. And uh, tickets are available on the website for that uh, live workshop. And she's going to be teaching in Florence in September. I still have tickets available. Pat Southern Pierce is going to be teaching in person in Niagara on the Lake in September. And I still have some tickets available for that. Hugo Costa is teaching a workshop in Rome in September. Tickets are available for that. David Morales will be teaching a workshop in Granada, Spain in October. And Kosha Kuna is the uh, co-founder of Sketchbook School is going to be teaching a workshop in Malta in November. Tickets available for that. And finally, it, you are also invited to join me for my weekly sketching tutorials called Feed Your Creative Soul. And uh, we're going to be having a lot of fun sketching together and learning new tips and tri tricks. And you can uh, find out more about how you can join those weekly sketching tutorials on our website, studio56boutique.com. And if you are not a, uh, a newsletter subscriber, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter. It's really hard for me to email you one by one, but if you subscribe to the newsletter, then all of these wonderful things that are coming up, free interviews, free book draws, uh, online workshops, and live in-person vacation workshops are all uh, posted there in our newsletter. And so please subscribe. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to our interview. I appreciate so much each one of you. And I want to thank you so much for coming and hope you have a fabulous week. Happy sketching, everyone. Take care.